What I originally planned was an expose on how Nicki Minaj is actually a cyborg, but I've learned otherwise. She's just too perfect. So insanely perfect that my conclusion was hard to believe. She is, in fact, an android. And so we're clear, cyborgs still have human organs, but androids are entirely synthetic. I also believe there are two different androids in this video, but can't always differentiate between the two, so I can't point them out. These are mostly pictures from her super base, super base video. About a year and a half ago, I think, I saw this poster at a local mall, and I actually thought it was an advertisement for a new doll. I mean, she's perfectly proportioned in all the right ways, so that was my first clue. My first assumption, which I admit was selfishly made on the hope that she could still mate, was that only her bottom half was synthetic, namely the endoskeleton and whatever devices they use for synthetic muscles. I originally thought the command center was implanted into her brain which communicated to the mechanical control in her abdomen. Her butt isn't just big for looks, it houses two motorcycle batteries, and on top of the battery is a layer of air which is then overlapped with mechanically and aesthetically functional hydraulic fluid. I forgot to put the battery in this picture, but having fluid on top gives it a more realistic look and motion. The high pressure gas underneath better hides the form of the battery and gives her butt a quality bounce. My further observations would convince me that there was much more to it. If she had been a cyborg, more than likely she should have real skin. This might simply be wax or oil on her skin, but I'm not convinced. You probably can't see it in this picture, but watch the video in high definition. You can see that whatever is on the surface of her skin is very hydrophobic if you compare it to your own skin after contact with water. Another thing you'll notice about her skin is that she has no pores and no imperfections. Just makeup? I'm not convinced. Her eyebrows are also artificially conceived. They're not meticulously plucked like a pop star would do, but they're made to look as if they're naturally perfect. I'd also like to point out that this is the only supposedly real hair we ever see on her. There are a few strange things about her eyes, too. In this picture, it seemed that the patterns in her iris are too systematic, but could probably just be me. However, again, you have to see this in high definition, but it might appear to be a contact lens. It's actually a removable optic sensor. The faint line you see is simply where the optical sensor is screwed in. Her eyes are essentially non-functional, but they need to identify where to point. This early model, identified by the incongruent striations in the iris, which are actually caused by internal refraction. Her new optic sensors can identify humans, so her eye direction can be more automatic and not up to the controller in their operations room. In her right eye, you can see this peculiar rainbow. This is a clue to how the lenses are actually a stratified or crystalline construction. This was better to capture the tiny red lights that you had in the studio for communicating where I should point. I thought the next most obvious clues would be in the muscles. The muscle she used the most would be around her mouth. I'm not laughing. This is really where I... Okay, now I'm laughing. This is really where I became a believer that she was 100% android. I'm not going to try to pronounce the muscle names. I'm sorry, anyway. Okay, the B set and humans work together to provide a lift for the lips. In an android, would only need one. In humans, the C set pulls up the pulls the lip back and works along with the B set to give the lips a very uniform movement. Androids only use C for visual purposes, as D is configured to do most of the shape work. As far as the A's go. Look in a mirror and try lifting your eyebrow without getting wrinkles on your forehead. Nikki doesn't have this problem because her muscle is shorter. Technically, Nikki has no muscle, but the devices were designed not only for function, but to appear as if muscle, just so I'm clear. If Nikki were a cyborg, it would be hard to see the B muscles working together. Human muscles would be less defined since they have broader range of motion. The single android muscles would appear much more visibly and at more accurate more acute angles. Drawing lines on the shadow shows the acute angles which reveal the single cheek to lip muscle. It's much harder to get details out of our larger muscles, but there are a few things to note about how they move, much too perfectly. Human muscle cells don't fire all at once. This makes it difficult to have a smooth upward motion from the arms as the number of cells constricting will need to increase as you go up. 
Not a big deal, but they become much more smooth if your arms are based on a pulley system attached to an aluminum alloy spine. Her hand motions are actually controlled from a, by radio signals from a mechanical center. You also notice when you watch the video that a lot of her motions, especially the faster ones, come to an instant stop. Human muscles also don't do this, at least not to the extent hers do. It's meant to look like a camera trick and, to an extent, it is. It was shot in a slow motion, but they deleted just enough frames per second to give it a more rigid look. This was actually an attempt to glaze over her more jerky motions. If you think it's the camera, you don't consider the fact that she's a robot. When her friends are involved, they use the newer of the two androids. It's harder to tell, but you'll notice when her lower half is more active, her mouth and eyes are less active. I'm actually showing this picture for two reasons, though. First, the pink arrows on her waist are actually the same size, but Nikki looks smaller. This is because of her more unnatural oval abdominal structure that facilitates her arm pulleys. Second, back to the skin, you'll notice a pretty severe sheen difference. As a painter, I saw this right away. Subjects B and C exhibit more of the equivalent of a matter eggshell sheen. The light distributes more broadly. Subject A could be satin, but the angle of the light amplifies the reflection, which is also the case for Nikki, but her hiss is semi-gloss or high-gloss. Yes, wax or oil could provide this result, but why would she have them applied out of water? The conclusion? Android. In Russia, as well as in the West, research has been underway for many years in biological synthesis, that is, artificial life forms. And according to high intelligence, a stunning breakthrough took place in Russia some years ago. The Russians refer to this breakthrough as a providential discovery, something they learned almost by accident. They discovered the key to creating what are known as organic robotoids. An organic robotoid is an artificial robot-like creature. It looks and acts exactly like a human being, and yet it is not human. A robotoid is alive in a biological sense, but it is an artificial life form. Robotoids respond to conventional routine medical tests in the same way as humans do. They eat, they drink, they breathe, they bleed if cut, and they can be killed. Robotoids can also think, but they think only in the sense that a computer thinks. Like any other computer, the brain of a robotoid has to be programmed for each assignment it is given. But unlike many electronic computers, the biological computer brain of a robotoid possesses an enormous memory. As a result, robotoids can be programmed to communicate and think in such complex patterns that they act human. Organic robotoids are remarkable creatures, but they have many drawbacks. They don't grow or reproduce, but must be manufactured one by one in the desired form. They also have a very limited lifespan, measured in months or even weeks depending upon how they are utilized. This is due to the fact that their metabolism, while it resembles that of humans, is very inefficient. A robotoid can be manufactured on very short notice, a matter of hours. But after a few weeks or months, it suddenly begins to degenerate physically and mentally. When that takes place, the robotoid has to be removed from service and disposed of. To extend its useful life as much as possible, a robotoid is customarily cooled down to slow its metabolism between assignments. Organic robotoids are extremely expensive, troublesome creatures to produce and utilize. And robotoid capabilities do not exceed those of human beings. All they can really do is simulate human beings. But my friends, for intelligence purposes, that's all they have to do. To produce an organic robotoid, it is necessary to have a pattern to go by. The pattern required is that of genetic coding taken from a few cells from the body of a human being. In this respect, the Russian technique sounds like cloning, but the technique itself is totally unrelated to genuine cloning. A robotoid is produced within a matter of hours, 
and it stimulates the human donor at his current age. Like any man-made copy of anything, a robotoid is never a perfect copy of the human that is to be simulated. There's always small discrepancies in appearance and behavior, but these are seldom great enough to arouse any suspicion. Last month I revealed that the Russians can manufacture organic robotoids, which are almost exact carbon copies of real human beings. This is done by a process that simulates the genetic coding of the person to be copied. It sounds a little like cloning, but it's not. A clone of a human would itself be a human, but an organic robotoid is not human. It's an artificial life form, like an animal in some ways, but like a computerized machine in others. Every Russian robotoid has what is called a holographic brain. This brain duplicates essentially the entire memory of a person being copied. The key to doing this is a new technique called an ultrasonic cerebral hologram. Using high-frequency sound waves, which are inaudible, a complete three-dimensional picture is made of a person's brain. This is a painless, non-destructive process, and under the proper conditions it can be done without the person even being aware of it. Last month I revealed that the Russians are using Nelson Rockefeller's hit list to weed out Bolsheviks here in America, and for roughly three years they have been preparing for this day. They have been secretly making cerebral holograms of the people on the list at every opportunity. This has been done to every person on Rockefeller's list who has visited Russia or Eastern Europe in the past three years. When an organic robotoid is made to simulate, for example, our late President Jimmy Carter, Two major factors are involved. One is the genetic coding required to simulate Carter's appearance, voice, fingerprints, and so on. The other is a holographic image of Carter's brain. This image is a complete record of the neuron patterns which existed in Carter's brain at the moment the hologram was made. Therefore, it contains all of the memory and knowledge Carter had up to that moment. When a Carter robotoid is made, the biological computer in its head is caused to form according to the holographic record of Carter's brain. However, certain portions of the robotoid computer are caused to deviate from the holographic record. Uh, the end result is a biological computer which has to be programmed but which contains essentially all of Carter's memory, involuntary mannerisms, and the like. As a result, a Carter robotoid will automatically do certain kinds of things without the need for specific programming. For example, a Carter robotoid will seem to recognize old friends. That's because the computer memory of the robotoid reproduces Carter's memory of that friend. The holographic process puts it there automatically without the Russian programmers even having to know it's there. Organic robotoids are such amazing creatures that they are still a subject of questioning and debate. This is true even among the Russian scientists who made them a reality. For example, robotoids seem to have no true instinct for self-preservation. In this regard, they act like machines, simply doing as they are told to do. By contrast, both humans and animals generally have the instinct for self-preservation. Robotoids can be programmed for self-preservation, but they are equally willing, if willing is the word, to perform suicide missions. Exploratory one-way trips into space are only one example of this. If a space mission looks too dangerous to risk the life of an experienced cosmonaut, a robotoid can now be used. The robotoid copy of the cosmonaut is already trained the moment it's made thanks to its holographic memory.
Who are the Anunnaki? The Anunnaki, which means those of royal blood, princely offspring, or those who Anu sent from heaven to earth, are believed to be a group of gods or deities that inhabited the earth during the time of the ancient Sumerian culture in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia itself means land between rivers and sits between the Tigris and the Euphrates River system, which is modern-day Iraq. As for the Sumerians, they were from the land of Sumer, which translates into land of the civilized kings and is the first recorded civilization of mankind. What's interesting to note, however, is that this first civilization appears to be quite advanced and far from primitive. The Sumerians were responsible for inventing such things as commerce, trade, science, writing, in the form of something called cuneiform, astronomy, and even had the first monarchy. Not bad for being the first known civilization, right? According to the Enuma Elis, which consists of seven tablets in an ancient Babylonian narrative telling the story of man's creation, it appears that the Anunnaki, also called the Anu, are the creators of mankind and that man's purpose is to serve the gods. These beings were not from this world, but were from the heavens. They can be found throughout Sumerian culture in writings, drawings, and statues, some of which portray the Anunnaki holding a holy grail, which is supposed to depict a special bloodline they've created. What's also interesting to note is that ancient biblical text mentions an offspring called the Nephilim, which inhabited the earth in the early days of mankind. Just as the Enuma Elis depicts the story of man being created by the gods, the book of Genesis also tells a creation story and mentions unearthly beings called the Nephilim. Genesis 6-4 states, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men, and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. Who or what were these sons of God that had children with the daughters of men? Could this be the bloodline that ancient Sumerians were also referring to? One theorist, Zechariah Sitchin, who has spent years studying Sumerian artifacts and Sumerian writing, believes that the Anunnaki genetically engineered man by crossbreeding their DNA and the DNA of Homo erectus. Their reason for doing this was to use Homo sapiens as a slave race for mining gold from the earth, a job which the Anunnaki themselves were sent to do. But why gold? Great question, and that is another story.